Okay. Good morning once again, everybody. It's very nice to be here in this local extension of the body and bride of Christ. And a warm welcome to the visitors that are here. God bless you. You're very welcome in this place. Welcome to be here with us as we seek to honor Jesus, to learn from him as we open the only book God's ever written, the, the Holy Bible. And uh, I meant to do this um, just after announcements, but the first thing to go is the memory, I think, sometimes. I really think that uh, before we begin consulting God's Word, we should pray together for our country. Let, let's pray for the leadership that's over us. I fear the trajectory of our country isn't good, and nothing's going to change around here if God doesn't step in. And I don't think he's going to step in unless his people really pray fervently, sincerely, with, uh, with um, that har hearts that are really tuned into this, not just tossing up a prayer thoughtlessly, but deep concern in, in God's uh, people, in the hearts and minds of God's people. So let's have, just a, let's have a prayer together for the country that God's put us in. We want to be grateful for the freedoms that we do enjoy, but let's pray that God will rescue this nation. Almighty God, in the mighty name of Jesus, this little group of Christians comes together now, Lord, and we're deeply concerned in our hearts and minds over the direction our country has taken as of late. We're very grateful, Lord. We are grateful for the freedom we enjoy, the good things we enjoy here. Uh, our health care, as Jerry always reminds us, and rightly so, a health care system that isn't perfect, but we are so grateful that we have something like this in place where doctors, nurses, educated people can look at us and, uh, and treat our, our wounded and uh, diseased bodies and get us uh, functioning again. We thank you for local law enforcement. We thank you for regional governments. We thank you, God, that there is something that looks like law and order here in this place and that we do have a good measure of freedom and security. But, oh God, our elected officials really aren't men and women of wisdom anymore. There seems to be no outward profession of faith, no God-given moral sensibilities, no God-given wisdom. And Lord, we're worried that our country is going to dissolve and crack and, and, and to really fall into disaster. So Father, we ask you even in the last of days to reach down and by your Holy Spirit to change the direction our country is taking. We ask you to evacuate offices that are now occupied by wicked people and instead fill those offices with people who are good, morally upright, those who have the fear of the Lord, the requisite fear of the Lord, and also enjoy wisdom from God and can use that wisdom to make this place more honoring to the Lord and a greater blessing to his people. So we ask you, God, now to rescue our country. We leave this with you, dear Father, sovereign King over all eternity. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, thank you for praying with me on that one. I pray for my country usually twice a day, fervent prayer for our country. I know others are doing it, and uh, God commands us to do it, and let's expect great things in the future, okay? All right, so... Let's go now to 2 Samuel and the 12th chapter. This is where we are in the Bible as we journey together through the scriptures. We're in 2 Samuel and the 12th chapter. And I've been thinking a lot about our own country because as I have studied the Bible, we're thinking about national ethnic Israel, the nation of Israel. And you're going to see as we walk through the Bible together that the nation of Israel is going to become a real mess very quickly. A real chaos here. And it all stems from David, the, the guy who looks like Jesus in so many ways. When he falls, he falls hard, and uh, he brings disaster upon the nation. God hasn't forgotten the nation. God still walks with them. God still rescues them. He still leads and guides and blesses them. But what needless hardships the nation endured because it began at the top with David. We're going to see that. And there are lessons here, you see? Now, just as an aid to the memory, what happened 
Uh, last time we, we were discussing the Bible together, considering the scriptures, David really, really fell, and he fell hard. He really departed from looking like Jesus. And what, what did he do? He seduced his neighbor's wife. Her name? Bathsheba. He seduced that woman when the husband w was away fighting for Israel, mind you. He got her pregnant, and then he tried to cover his crime, and when it wasn't working, he actually engineered the murder of that man. You say, David, you can't be so low as that. Yes, he could. And um, harsh consequences. The son that was conceived in that sin died. The little baby died. We saw that, and we talked about that. Well, David had a second child with Bathsheba, and his name is Solomon. Let's look at this together. Chapter 12, verses 24 and 25. You ready? Chapter 12, verse 24. Then, da then David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and went into her and lay with her. So she bore a son, and he called his name Solomon. Now the Lord loved him. And he sent word by the hand of Nathan the prophet, so he called his name Jedidiah because of the Lord. His official name is Solomon, but the name given him by God is Jedidiah, which means beloved of the Lord. And that is God's gentle way of encouraging David. He's saying, David, this child will live. You've, I mean, that crime you've committed was a horrible thing, and I needed to make an example. And so I took that child prematurely. That first child is now with me. But Solomon will live. He is beloved of the Lord. And of course, we're going to meet Solomon again, aren't we? As we walk through the Bible, he is going to become... One of the most wisest, well, actually, he will be the wisest man ever to walk the earth next to Jesus. A wise and very powerful and prosperous king, King Solomon. And we'll, we'll get to him yet if the Lord tarries. But God wanted to encourage David, this child will live. And if I could just synopsize what happened here, uh, David, of course, he's not supposed to do this. Now, Deuteronomy is very clear how the king is to behave. And David just sort of did his own thing again. But David acquired to himself multiple wives. God permitted it, but God was not giving a seal of approval on it. And because he had multiple wives, he had multiple children. And one of these boys was a man named Amnon. You ever hear of him? Amnon? A complete reprobate. Completely morally handicapped, this person. Why do I say that? Because Amnon lusted after one of his half-sisters. Her name was Tamar. He... He, all he wanted was to have relations with his sister. And the man was so wicked and depraved, he faked an illness. He faked like he was sick on his deathbed kind of thing. And she came in to serve him. You know what he did? He forced himself on her. How, I mean, how wicked can you be? A kingdom full of beautiful women, and he does this to his own flesh and blood. And not only that, I mean, this is devastating enough for the poor woman. After he had done it, he absolutely despised her, didn't want to look at her anymore. He had his way with her, and now she can be just thrown aside like some kind of piece of garbage or something. Well, the woman was absolutely ju I mean, just devastated by what had happened to her, and uh, the entire horrible event became known to her brother Absalom and to her father, King David. And I want you to see something here. Just go now ahead in your Bibles to chapter 13 and verse 21. Chapter 13, just flip ahead, and verse 21. But when King David heard all these things, he was very angry. Well, I guess so. Wouldn't we all be? You'd be, you'd be really angry, and you figured you'd do something about this. Verse 22, and Absalom, that's Tamar's brother, and Absalom spoke to his brother Amnon, neither good nor bad, for Absalom hated Amnon because he had forced his sister Tamar. So uh, both King David and his son Absalom are very upset about what has happened here. But David, you're going to find out, did absolutely nothing. He, there was no move to punish this person. He did nothing. He was angry, but he didn't do anything. Now why not? Why didn't he do something here? Now, we don't really know all the reasons why, but I think it's a safe bet that because David's own crimes 
in, involved sexual deviance. He was hesitant to judge another who were guilty, they were guilty of something similar. This is very true. Even in the church today, we are often quite a bit less judgmental of people who commit crimes that we ourselves are guilty of. Isn't that true? Both David and Amnon were guilty of sexual deviance and misconduct, and yet David's crime, in some ways, was much worse than Amnon's. Now, David didn't rape Bathsheba, but he did something almost as bad. He, he did pressure her, and in, in the end, he seduced her. But then he went ahead and murdered her husband. Now, that's, that's much more horrible. I mean, that's orders of magnitude more horrible. And um, I think David, because of these things, was not so quick to judge his son Amnon. I think something like that might be going on here. And that happens, that kind of thing happens in the church. In the North American church, Christians will rant and rave and will hoot and holler about all kinds of crimes we're not guilty of. And you can just use your imagination. I'll give you an example. Now, I don't see this a lot here in this church. I really feel like our little church is something very special. But I'm speaking generally now. Generally, I hear Christians, they will, uh, because they don't struggle with same-sex attraction, they will freely and openly condemn things like same-sex marriage or homosexual behavior or gay pride marches and so on. And rightly so. I consider these things to be moral abominations. But we'll spend all kinds of time condemning that. But how many Christians have you heard really uh, spend any time at all discussing the improper use of our own time and resources? Uh, how we manage our finances? How much money we waste on stupid, friv frivolous, ridiculous things of no eternal value contribute really nothing to the cause of Christ and the advancement of the gospel uh, or the wasting of time doing nothing. Sitting in front of a screen, maybe, or really doing nothing. Now, of course, we don't condemn leisure around here. We don't condemn a vacation. We don't, command, uh, we don't condemn entertainment. God has given us all good things to enjoy, Paul says. But we're talking about inordinate amounts of time and resources just spent on nothing. I don't hear a lot of Christians talking about that. I think it's because many of us feel maybe a tiny twinge of guilt that we're not giving and we're not doing all that we could for the cause of Christ on the earth. And I'm going to leave that with you. I, I'm not here to bludgeon us or make people feel guilty, but I do think that um, what we see here with David, we do see that in the church too, the professing church. That's why we don't talk so much about it here. Now, what happened? Well, both David and Absalom were angry with Amnon's horrible behavior, but only Absalom resolved to actually do something about it. And you know what this man did? He stewed for two full years. He brooded, he seethed, he plotted for two years. David, may, David was thinking to just sweep this under the rug and it'll be fine. Absalom said, no way. I'm going to get that brother of mine for what he did to my sister. And after two solid years, Absalom invited all his brothers to a nice feast. Hey, let's have a feast together. Won't this be a friendly, enjoyable gathering? We can catch up and, and we can enjoy one another's company. And when they had arrived for the feast, Absalom commanded the dagger men to come out of the shadows and slay Amnon, kill him right there and they butchered him right on the spot. And of course, the other brothers didn't know who would be next, and there was a great confusion, and a whole uh, chaotic episode ensued, and word got back to David that Absalom is killing people, and all your sons are dead. There was half-truths and confusion, and, and in all this, Absalom himself rushed away to a place called Gesher, and he stayed there for three years, put himself in exile. He said, if I hang around Jerusalem, they're going to execute me. So he got out. He got out of Dodge, as they say. <laughs> Three years. And you know what? During that time, King David mourned for his son Absalom. It says, his, you know, David, he's a pretty emotional person, isn't he? He's a songwriter. He's a poet. And he's very emotional. And he really did love his son Absalom, and he wanted to see him again, but 
the, the situation was very difficult, wasn't it? It was complicated. He couldn't just invite the boy back because it would look like he endorsed his murder. And he didn't want to give that message to, to the kingdom that we just endorse wholesale slaughter around here. There's got to be law and order. We, I mean, we, there is a little thing called the Mosaic Law, isn't there? And we want to be law keepers. But David was tormented in his soul about this. To absolutely tormented. Well, his military commander, Joab, observed this in David, and Joab said, you know what? I need to get Absalom back here. I need to put David's heart at rest. So Joab had a plan. Here's the plan of Joab. He said, I'm going to hire a wise woman from Tekoa, and I'm going to tell her what to, what to say to David, and I'm going to give her a little story for David. And David's going to think this is a true story, and once he hears it, and once he rules on this, he'll be convinced to bring his boy back, and all will be well again, okay? And I think that um, Joab here, he's, he's remembering Nathan the prophet. Do you remember when David had Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, killed, and he thought he got away with it? How was he confronted? Nathan the prophet came to David and gave David a little story, didn't he? about a man who had a beloved ewe sheep in his, in his home, and the rich man came and stole the sheep, and, and David, was, uh, David got the message. I'm that horrible rich man. I took Bathsheba. I think Joab is thinking about these things. He's reflecting on these things. So he hired this woman to uh, tell David a little story, and the idea is to get the message through to David. Bring Absalom back. It'll be okay. All right? So uh, let's read here uh, the, some of the story. Go to chapter 14. Just flip ahead, chapter 14. And we're going to hear what the woman said to David. Verse 6. Chapter 14, verse 6. So now this is the woman speaking to the king. Now your maidservant had two sons, and the two fought with each other in the field, and there was no one to part them, but the one struck the other and killed him. And now the whole family has risen up against your maidservant, and they said, Deliver him who struck his brother, that we may execute him for the life of his brother whom he killed. And we will destroy the heir also, so, that, so they would extinguish my ember that is left and leave to my husband neither name nor remnant on the earth. So we get the picture here. This woman, has, she has come to David, and she told him this story. She said, My two sons were fighting and no one could get in there to separate them, and one killed the other one. So in all the world, I have only one child, and it's him, the, the, the manslayer. And the rest of the family wants him executed. They want justice in Israel, but I am harboring him. I'm protecting him. He's my only son. If he is killed, we'll have no pedigree. I mean, we'll have no offspring, no progeny. And... Um, and it seems like her own life is in danger. The family is applying real pressure on her. They said, you deliver him up. And there's a, there's a bit of a threat here even to her. Now listen to how David responded to her request. Verse 8. Then the king said to the woman, Go to your house, and I will give orders concerning you. So David didn't say to the woman, Get out of here. This is none of my concern. He, he said, okay, Give me a minute. Go home, I will make a ruling, and I, and I will help you, okay? But for the woman, this is just not quick enough. She wants help, like, right now. This is not good enough, king. And look what she says in verse 9. And the woman of Tekoa said to the king, My lord, O king, let the iniquity be on me and on my father's house, and the king and his throne be guiltless. She's saying, just protect my son, and if the word gets around that you let a guilty person go free, we will make sure that all the iniquity falls on us. We, are, we will make sure that everybody knows you were behaving in a benevolent fashion, and if there was any wrongdoing, everyone will know it's, it's because of us. It's my house. Let the iniquity be with us, okay? And the king will remain absolutely blameless in the eyes of Israel. That's the deal that she made with him. And it sounded pretty good uh, to David. Look at verse 10. So the king said, Whoever says anything to you, bring him to me. 
and he shall not touch you any more. Then she said, Please let the king remember the Lord your God, and do not permit the avenger of blood to destroy any more, lest they destroy my son. And he said, As the Lord lives, not one hair of your son shall fall to the ground. See, David was prepared to help this lady, and, but she wanted something more solid. She says uh, in verse 10, uh, rather verse 11, verse 11, please let the king remember the Lord your God. Now what does that mean? That means, David, I want you to swear with an oath to God now that you're going to help me. And David was, he was moved to do that. And at the end of verse 11, he says, as the Lord lives, not one hair of your son shall fall to the ground. David was prepared to help her. She said, swear it to God, so he did. David said, no problem. Now, look what happened here. Verse 12. Therefore the woman said, please let your maidservant speak another word to my lord the king. And he said, say on. So the woman said, why then have you schemed such a thing against the people of God? For the king speaks this thing as one who is guilty in that the king does not bring his banished one home again. She's trying to say here, Absalom should not face the death penalty. He did slay his brother, that's true, but the circumstances are complicated. We can understand Absalom's motives. We can, to some extent or other, sympathize with the man. We believe in this situation, grace may justifiably be offered. And that's her point, okay? And I want to share with you one of the most profound verses in all the scriptures. It's the next thing out of her mouth. It's verse 14, and it's on the front of your bulletin, mind you. Verse 14, the woman's still speaking now. For we, will sh for we will surely die and become like water spilt on the ground, which cannot be gathered up again. Yet God does not take away a life, but he devises means so that his banished ones are not expelled from him. Now that is absolutely profound. I mean, earth-shakingly profound. That's deep. In the immediate context, she wants David to remember that God is gracious, and so we have some moral obligation to be gracious also. The clock is also ticking. She says we all die. We're like water spilt on the ground. You can't gather the water again. Absalom's not going to live forever, king. Call him back now. That's the, that's the immediate context before it's too late. Be reconciled to your boy. And we get that. That's the, that's the point. But this is much, much deeper than that. This woman is prophesying here, much the same way that Caiaphas, the high priest, in the days of Jesus prophesied. Do you remember in John, the 12th chapter, Caiaphas said, I think this is John 12, you can check me out on that, I'm going by memory here, but Somewhere around John 11 or 12, Caiaphas, the high priest, John says, prophesied. He said, it's better for this man, Jesus, to die than the whole nation perish. One man will die for all of us. And, and John said, that guy being high priest the year, that year prophesied when he said that. And yet he didn't even know what he was saying. In Jesus, he saw somebody who may be construed as an insurrectionist, and he might bring down the wrath of Rome on everybody. So let's just get this man killed so the nation of Israel can continue. Even though we're subjugated under Rome, at least they're not coming in here and, um, and killing everybody, really suppressing us. It's better that one man die for the nation. That's, see, now he was prophesying. He was speaking of something much deeper, wasn't he? Just like this wise woman from Tekoa. It's go, her words go beyond the immediate context, don't they? She says, surely we all die, for we surely die. Now that is called the certainty of death. David will say it on his deathbed, I go the way of all the earth. I'm not doing some special thing here. Joshua said it too, I go the way of all the earth. It's a fate that's common to all men. It is appointed unto man once to die. We're all going to face it. 
And then she says, we're like water spilt on the ground that can't be gathered up again. That's the apparent permanency of death and the apparent impossibility of resurrection. You die, you don't come back. You, d you go to the dust and you can't be gathered up again. The certainty of death, the inevitability of it, and the permanency of it, it all seems to be very clear based on human experience. And the situation seems to be quite hopeless, doesn't it? I mean, you're going to say, I'm not coming back to church. I don't think I like what Pastor John's saying here. <laughs> but that's how it appears, doesn't it? The grave is never full. It keeps devouring. And we are like water spilt on the ground. We die, and you're gone forever, apparently. Apparently. But the woman says something else. Two words. Two very powerful words. Yet God. Oh, now that changes things, doesn't it? You got a hopeless situation. We need a miracle. But God, yet God. Oh, God's involved. Okay, all bets are off. <laughs> now something can happen around here. My favorite example, maybe it's your favorite example too, involves a man named Moses. You ever hear of him? <laughs> and he brought two million frightened people to the shores of the Red Sea. And hot on their, on their trail was the most powerful army on earth. And the commander of that powerful army said, I've got them! They're hedged in between the sea and the wilderness. And now there's going to be a tremendous slaughter this day. I will teach Israel to cross me. And the people cried out to Moses, we're going to die. Certainly we're going to die here in the wilderness. And Moses said, you stand still and you behold the salvation of our God. And he stretched his staff over the waters and the waters opened. Oh, God was involved. Changes everything. We are like water spilt on the ground which cannot be gathered again. Yet God, oh, God has something to say about our, about our death, our physical death. God's involved, right, right. The woman said, he devises means. He exercises infinite wisdom and power operating through a nature that is omnibenevolent. God is love. Thank you, Lord. You are love. And you exercise infinite wisdom and power to do what? You can hardly imagine it. To reconcile lost sinners to himself to quicken and glorify one's frail and broken mortal bodies even after they've seen the grave. He can do it. He can trample death underfoot. He can swallow it up in victory. Our God, I want to say it because we need to remember it, our God specializes in accomplishing things the world says is impossible. He says, you stand back and watch it happen. Jesus said, in effect, if you doubt this, why don't you just conduct a little experiment on me? Why don't you? And they did. In ghastly fashion, they took that body, that beautiful body of Jesus, and they nailed him to a tree. And there he died, unrecognizable as a human being. The ugliness of sin there displayed in ghastly fashion in the body of Jesus. There you got to see how ugly sin really, really is. He bare our sins in his body on the tree. And they took him down and put him in a tomb. And in the eyes of the world, that's it. We're finished with him. He will never rise again. Oh, really? Famous last words. And on the third day, you know what happened. A group of women followers came to the tomb. Oh, the stone's not here. And they looked inside. The body's gone. We don't know where they've laid the Lord. And Jesus turned and looked at Mary. Mary, he said. Rabboni, she replied. He was back. Not resuscitated, resurrected to glory, never to be touched by death again. Our God specializes in the impossible. He restores life and joy and hope. And our Lord Jesus, the one that loved us first, he's the first fruits of them that slept. 
your death is not the end. The death of your loved ones is not the end. Death doesn't get the last say around here. And death is not the hero of the plot either. Death is the last enemy to be destroyed, Paul says. It will be swallowed up in victory. And the day is coming, and we're one hour closer to it now, when there will be no more death, no sorrow, no tears, no crying, no pain. Death and Hades will be cast into that lake of fire forever, never to be seen, never to be contemplated, ever again. They will never more intrude into God's beautiful created order. There will be a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness forever. And God, if you trust him, he will take you onto the shores of that beautiful place safely. Beginning right now. He won't drop you halfway. God makes good on his promises. And he specializes even in those things that you think are impossible. Aren't you glad? That's a God worth worshiping. That's a God worth listening to, obeying, walking with, following, telling people about, defending. That's a God worth all those things and infinitely more. And I get worked up about these things. <laughs> that's all I want to teach this morning. Maybe that's enough. Hey? <laughs> We're going to end a little early. Let's have a word of prayer. Hopefully our hearts are renewed with love and appreciation for Jesus Christ, God's beloved one. Let's pray to our thrice holy God and let's give him glory. Heavenly Father, in the mighty and beautiful matchless name of Jesus, we thank you from our hearts this morning for a Bible, a perfect Bible, that tells us about Jesus, how beautiful he is, what he has done, what he yet will do. Thank you for the wise words, the prophetic words, of the woman from Tekoa. Oh, sovereign God, you put those words in her lips. You had them recorded. You had them preserved down through the ages so we could read and be encouraged and enjoy so great a salvation together. Thank you, God, for this special morning where we could open the Bible and hear these things that our hearts, our souls would be renewed with love and appreciation for Jesus. Thank you, God, for your tender grace, your mercy. Thank you that you wash us clean moment by moment in the life-saving, mysterious power of Christ's own blood. Thank you, God. Thank you that we can behold our Savior evermore in that beautiful place called the new heavens and the new earth that even now you are preparing for us. Lord, thank you. We praise you. We honor you. And we ask you, God, to help us to be people who please you in all things moment by moment. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen and amen. Praise God. Praise our beautiful Savior. Amen. And God bless you all.